All right. We're live. Thank you for joining another exciting episode of Film Sessions. Yay. I'm your host. If you don't know who I am and you're on this channel, you've messed up. Or I've done my job well. Go back. I don't want you here. Okay. <laughs> this episode, I wanted to feature some products. First, we have this exciting new book, Jiu-Jitsu and Me Too. Follow along on the Jiu-Jitsu and Me journey with young Bobby as he goes through his Jiu-Jitsu journey. This is written by Robert Wilson and illustrated by Rio Shuvo. Uh, young Bobby has some problems. He's picked last for sports. He's not really into school, and he doesn't like the school year. He likes summers. And you can get the first book and now this brand new second book that's out. And you can follow him on his quest of going from an untrained young jiu-jitsu player all the way to a competitor. Um, his instructor is Mr. Miller. So I'm a big fan of that. But a uh, really cool book. Thank you for, to Robert Wilson for sending it to me. I bought the first one. It's one of those things that when I visit the elementary schools around here for reading weeks and stuff, I read that book. So, good book for you to get your kids into jiu-jitsu. It's a good read. Yeah. Yes, it is. I also want to bring up a, a couple other feature products. This badass motherfucking rash guard. Our warrior rash guard. Buy it. We have a few large, some XL, and like one double XL left. And the new t shirt Pull Guard or Die. It's a throwback to the old video game Skate or Die. And like how skaters were rebels in that era, the guard pullers are rebels of today. So if you're in middle Georgia and you haven't gotten this shirt and you train in the gi, shame on you. If you train at my school or Bubby's school at Rush MMA, you need to come down here and buy this damn shirt. Yes, I'd, I just wanted to bring that to everybody's attention. Those are cool shirts. Also, I have a decadent coffee. Because it's good. So today on the Miller Martial Arts Show, another film sessions. So let's go, let's pick up where we left off. Um, we're back here. Uh, I started in November of 03. We covered those first two fights with my brother, Micah Miller. We did his amateur debut, and we did Bobby Mitchell's amateur debut. They, those were not on the same shows, but that was a cool episode. Then we got into my loss with Daizo Ishigi, who became future king of Pancrase. Then we traveled to Virginia Beach, where I fought twice in one night again against Blake Romano and Nick Catone. Uh, came out unscathed, aside from probably the kidney damage that I did myself on that weight cut. Then I traveled to New Orleans. Myself and Bubby did. That was Bubby's amateur debut. And I took out a 16-year-old in Gavin Murray. Um, easy dub. So at this point, I am 4-1 and one in my amateur career. Now, I did, between that Gavin Murray fight and this fight, I fought my teammate, Trey Brown, in what was considered an exhibition because he was a couple weight classes ahead of me. Um, his opponent no-showed, mine no-showed, and we fought each other. So uh, it was, if it went the distance or even if it didn't, both people's hands were raised in that belt, and it was a draw. But it, uh, it was unofficial. Um, but I want to get him in so we can watch that fight together and – and uh, talk about that. So this is the first sanctioned fight. Between June and November. So November of 04. So this is about one year from that 
debut that I had where I fight this competitor in Anthony LaPietra or LaPietra. And this is a show at Submission Fighting Open 11, SFO 11, that was promoted by Matthew Waller. If you haven't gone and listened to his podcast and his origin story and what it was like promoting these shows, you can find that on our podcast on this YouTube platform or any other platform. But I give some insight into who he was and what it was like promoting these shows in that time. So let's see who else was on this show before we dive into this fight. Speaking of fighting and beating up 16-year-olds, Bubby Mitchell fought a young guy, Landon Gaddy. Poor Landon. His parents signed the waiver for that monster to fight him. I wanted to get him in today. We could have both done this uh, same uh, evening together. But we'll do that another time for sure. This was interesting. So there was, I think, three tournaments that were happening or two tournaments that were happening. Myself and Bubby were in two separate tournaments. And we had to fight early in the night because you were expected to fight a second time. And unfortunately, both of our opponents got injured in their fights. So Bubby fought this guy, Landon Gaddy. Then he was supposed to fight the winner of Philip Peterson, a name you guys might remember. He was the f- guy I made my debut against, and Logan Johnson. And I think this, I think there was a hand injury. Um, Philip Peterson won by a TKO in the second round. Then I fight this guy, Anthony Lapitra, and then Charles Nutt, a name you'll hear later on a future episode. He brutally knocked out this guy Russell Scott in the first round and he broke his hand so we were just me and Bubby were crowned champs there's no such thing as winning by uh, forfeit or your opponent unable to fight but since that didn't happen we just he they brought us in at the end of the night and said all right these guys are the champs Brian Bowles um, future WEC Bantamweight world champion fought on this card and he was a hardcore gym guy Uh, trained by Adam Singer and Rory Singer, same gym that Forrest Griffin came out of. Jake Vickers was one of our guys. He fought, so that's three of the Team Praxis or Academy of Fighting Arts guys. My good friend, George uh, Kasaev, Georgi, he fought on that card. Another teammate of ours, uh, fourth teammate, Matt Corsi, he had a bout. Stephen Ledbetter, future WC uh, veteran, fought on that card. I don't know who these guys are or that guy. And uh, big man Ken Coffey fought my dad. Uh, Ken Coffey, huge guy. Uh, He now works with the commission, Georgia State Athletic Commission, or Georgia Athletic Entertainment Commission, rather. And James Thorpe, Dustin Hokum. I think that might have been a tournament, too. I'm not sure. That was too... Uh, sets of big heavies fighting, but there was no second bout there either, I don't believe. So pretty cool card. Looks like it had 12 fights on it or so. That's a that's a good-sized card. Uh, it was, took place at the Macon City Auditorium in Macon, Georgia, November 6th. Really cool experience. It was nice because this is the uh, second time that I got to fight in the auditorium. And as you guys remember, I had lost previously in front of my hometown crowd, which motivated me to get back into it. So it was nice to uh, get a win in there this time. I believe that was after my brother had that awesome tournament that we did an episode on as well. So let's get to it. November 6, 2004. Let's pull pull this bad boy up. What should we do? Volume? No volume. No volume. No volume. Only unless you want to hear people screaming in the background. and Yeah, that. Say it. Even we can leave it for the ambiance. doesn't mute it on the screen. Oh, it doesn't? Today it doesn't. That technology, right? There we go. Okay. Let's see what happens here. 
So this is definitely not ethical with my coach, Cam McCarg, being the referee. But <laughs> he always knew that, and he always um, – Where is this? The Macon City Auditorium. Auditorium. Okay. I asked that as I read that. Yeah, and as I already talked about it. Yeah. Front kick you in the chest. But then you, got, then you got that awesome shirt on. Yeah. So you, you, you don't want to mess up that pull guard or die shirt. Um, yeah, so my coach is the referee, but he always, you know, he talked about I'm going to be very firm, especially with you guys. You guys know the rules, so I'm not going to be playing around with you guys. Um, so it's actually going to be tougher for me to referee you guys. And the promoter, since he was friends with us, you guys remember Matt talking about like he wanted to get us fights that were not – walkthroughs um especially like once you got some experience he him and brett moses both they wanted to challenge you so it was kind of tough for fighting on those cards as you guys remember i lost the last uh fight that i fought in, you know on the hometown show had a ringer in there let's see what happens oh so two similar builds but this guy is jacked. He's got real skinny legs, but his upper body was beefy. Like he had a, a chest and I remember he wore a beanie and uh, he just, I remember like going like, man, how's that guy, like, guy going to weigh in at 150 or whatever, but he did and he didn't have much of a lower body. Oh, yes. oh yeah, that was dope. Let's watch that again. So he comes at me with a teep, I think. Yep. And I catch it right in the heel, hit the sweep. That was clean. But I'm just standing over him. He got up pretty quick. Then we get in this entangled head and arm position that maybe even just turns into a head position. He's, like, really pinning me down, holding me down. Um, this is just classic headlock escape stuff. I'm working to the back. I had hair back then, so he's, like, really squeezing, and that's kind of creating, it, you know, it's difficult for me to get out. But I ended up working out with just a classic kind of self-defense escape. Now, this was really annoying. See how he's putting his feet in my, my armpits there? I had to get rid of that, but I'm an idiot. But when you're in this position, you can get rid of the feet, but then you have to posture to punch. Well, as you posture to punch, then he's putting the feet, in, you know, around your waist or in your armpits. So this against a guy who's real wiry, and I'm also wiry, so that makes it even more wiry. You have to be really tight with your space when you're holding a, a dominant position like this because the scrambles are always there. That's why I was unable to, you know, just raise up and start throwing bombs because the moment you raise up, that's when he's doing what he's doing here. Right. Little punches when I can. You today, how do you solve that with the wire? You got reaching up over there with his feet. I play low mount. You yeah. you know yeah. my game. Yeah. I don't I don't even like the high mount anymore. Um, this is a great freeze frame right here. I mean, just look at mm -hmm. this guy. The good thing is you take away the power of the hips being in the high mount, so the upa isn't there. You could see he lifted his – he did a bridge or a upa earlier, and I didn't go anywhere because my hips are so far above his hips. So in that way, it's good to play a high mount. However, he can bend. And, again – and, guys, I was a year and a half into training at this right. point, or less than, you know, a, just under a year and a half. That's why my question was like today. And I had like six fights, so, but I, so I didn't have some of the skills that I have now. But now what I would do is I just play low mount. I don't I don't move to high mount. My coach reinforced low mount to me. Um, Roger Gracie, the, you know, arguably the goat, plays a good high mount. So it's not about what's better. I just for my body type, I noticed I was having more escapes and scrambles forced on me when I would move to the high mount. Um, so now I just play low mount. It keeps doing the same thing. It's very frustrating because the crowd got really excited when I originally got the mount. 
not the most educated crowd, but they knew that Mount was good. You yeah. get on top, it's good. And you start throwing punches, so they're losing their minds. But then you can tell I'm in this position for a while, so uh, it starts to lose its its appeal. They're like, yeah. Uh, uh, somebody hit somebody. <laughs> you know, but this guy's doing a very good job. Kind of see me working for an arm bar. Let's fix this. Oh, thing. looking for that spin. Arm lost bar. the mount. That's exactly what I was talking about there. And he's going from a foot for a footlock position, but not the best. And I just follow it up to neon belly. Throw some hammer fists. Get it. He's still doing the same thing with his legs, but just from the neon belly. Using my shin to trap his arm. His foot still in the armpit. Yeah, see where at the beginning right there, if you had done like a low mount, like right when you mounted him, you would have shut all that down. Like his, he would have never gotten up in your armpit. Right. It's more annoying. I understand that, but yeah. So it takes a lot of patience. You know, you got to have a strong grappling base to uh, just stay. Look at this guy's connecting his hands like a rubber guard, but from the bottom of mount on your leg. And I'm trying to work back in. You can see this is this is an unidentifiable position. I don't even really know what he's trying to do. Got himself on a toehold here. And you can just see my frustration, like kind of looking up, kind of taking a breath, trying to listen to my corner. And I feel that the arm bar's there, but these darn feet are there. And then I slip. Nice. All right. Got the tap. All right. W wobbly camera. All right, my my boy Blake Bowman in the house. Don't really feel too much about this guy. He was I was really annoyed, and I knew that I had to fight a second time. There's my brother Micah. All right, I'm getting fist bumps. Ross Hagerman in the house. Cliff Hagerman. See Mr. Bobby Gay looks like over there. Just a bunch of teammates. There's Bubby, old jacked up Bubby in the background. He's pumped for me, too. He had already won just a moment ago, so he, he's there in my corner. And uh, we're prepping to uh, fight a second time. So, yeah. Okay. So let's go back. Let's go back to the beginning. So in the last fight where I fought the guy Gavin Murray, I – I sprinted out to him because I was going to do that flying knee and that I had done in a previous fight in the Virginia Beach tournament, but then he put his, his glove out to touch. Even though we said there would be no glove touching, we specifically talked about it. I'm not touching your glove. And then, like, he reached out anyways. So that was annoying. But me and this guy didn't talk, and, oh, and he kind of ran out. I don't touch gloves. Yeah, it's preference. I, I don't – we touched in the locker room, and we touched right when the ref talks, like if the ref calls us to the middle. Mm -hmm. But I've just seen too many guys get that overhand. Yeah, I've seen some some guys, even at a professional level, cheap shot. I, I don't care. Like I don't it, think it's a cheap shot. If like, you want to touch, we can touch gloves. If you don't, I don't, I don't feel any way about it. So um, I think that if you don't like to, cool. If you yeah. do, cool. It's not a big deal. But I just kind of sidestep to avoid the kick. And he's doing some stance swapping. And, look, I'm just sprinting at him, hands down. You know, this is not super clean, obviously. And freeze framing that. What? Kind of throwing a right hand at the body. But he looks like crap. This is why it's amateur, guys. What is he doing? He's moving away. He's just moving But with his away. right arm. I, who knows? Just kind of jumping up, making sure you don't get hit with a left coming or something. He don't know. Okay, so then we both go to kick at the same time. And because I'm rotated, trying to – what I thought was throwing my kick, his teep is kind of glancing off the side, the right side of, of my body. And then I'm able to scoop the leg, fortunately. Now, this position I still teach today. It's real good uh, kickboxing or Muay Thai sweep. You have him up. It's hard because I'm pausing it, but – and this is back in the day on handheld cams. You guys get the gist. I'm, I'm making yeah, a, C, a C cup grip 
on the uh, heel, okay? And I'm holding it up and I'm, I'm lifting it up to the ceiling, okay? And notice this position with my left hand. It goes on the opposite side of the kick. So he's kicking me with his right leg and I take my left hand and I put it on the left side of his body. So that can create the motion to bend him over his right side of his body, taking him off of his base, okay? Um, cervical um, and thoracic spine, you're kind of taking that out of alignment with the, with the lumbar spine. And then you're throwing the kick low, because at this point he's on the balls of his feet for, for balance. And so you kick a, you know, as low as you possibly can as, you're pulling, as I'm pulling to my left and that kick should sweep him off the feet, and it does. Now, um, the one thing that has really advanced in modern MMA today is like the level of get up. Like we talked about like back then, guys actually fought off their back. That was like something they did. Um, if you landed in the guard, these guys would try to actively sweep or submit you. The getting up was something that it evolved. Um, like a good wrestler would just be like, no, I'm getting back up like a Maurice Smith and, you know, guys like that um, had already won world championships, you know, like even before this. But the level of get up, because guys were proud to, you know, we'll fight on the feet, we'll fight on the ground. But if you remember my first debut, I was standing over my opponent, Philip Peterson, in that first film sessions, and I'm throwing all those kicks. I'm standing over him. Mm -hmm. He's up against the ropes, so there's no wall to kind of use to get up. And I'm just like, oh, this is awesome. And I, they were free leg kicks. You know, I even did the little spinning um, uh, heel kick to try to get to his ankle or heel. That was something we trained. And all those free leg kicks. And I was like, oh, I can kind of, this is, you know, it was like flashback, you know. And I was getting ready to drop in and throw my 50 unanswered punches like I did against uh, Philip Peterson. I was like, oh, this is going the exact same way. And um, I just didn't have the understanding of top control. And to be honest with you, even as I was fighting in the UFC, I still didn't have an understanding of top control to the level I started to get as I was like a brown belt and probably like five to ten fights in the UFC already. Wow. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, you know, I, I you can see I'm just kind of standing. I'm going to play with the feet. I can do throw by Toriando or do a knee cut through this big wide open guard. Um or maybe just drop in with the, the punches or do a Sakuraba cartwheel pass, something fun and flashy. That was the stuff me and Micah were into. That was the stuff we trained all the time. So, but watch. Uh, oh, see, so even the guy says, come on. This guy, Anthony, you can see him doing that thing with his fingers there. So, look, he's like, come on, come on, you know, as if the sweep was nothing when the crowd lost their mind. <laughs> and so he's he's saying, come on, come on, come to the, gr the ground. I'm happy to oblige, you know. But uh, then he kicks and does a uh, not-so-technical stand-up. But then we get in this, like, head and arm body lock, and I just go to roll him over with a very, like, oh, and he re-counters. But then I re-counter. You countered the counter. You know, I put the single hook in, pull yourself up to the top, and work on getting your head free. If... He had had my bottom arm, which is why I can say control the bottom limit. I would have re-rolled him to my left side, which would have put him on his left rib cage. But I knew that I could come out on top in this position. And once I got my my head and hair free, quick mount, easy mount. Get get all the problems here. You know, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to posture and rain down these blows. And I'm going to get that cool looking TKO for the highlight reel. No, nah. this guy. You can tell this was like his main escape because he just goes to it. This was not done out of desperation. This is something that happened to him in the gym a lot, and he, he would go. Oh, and back then he would probably pop out every time in, every the, time. in the gym. Like nobody could – they're like, that so, thing you do always works. Right. Yeah. And then he comes over the top, gets both legs in front, and he's going for a foot lock. So this is a very familiar position for me. Uh, my instructor, Cam – had taught us this escape, this uh, this mount escape where you kind of come out the back, but then if they follow you and try to base, then you come out in a foot lock and your legs are around. Now, I have the inside position. That's, I was going to ask. I have the leg? inside position. That is true. But my coach Cam was such a good foot locker, 
he could heel hook you or straight ankle you from this specific position. Oh, wow. Um, and because of that, I was very familiar with footlocks in the beginning. Like this whole new era of footlocks is not something new. Now, I know that I'm not the greatest footlock guy, but I got a, a real good exposure in the beginning and cam was self-trained and he went over you know he was one of these guys that had been to some seminars all around and just played with stuff and he was like an anomaly cam was an anomaly so he was good and even like dean lister came into a seminar and i learned plenty at this dean lister seminar but in one specific position he was like oh you, you seen this i was like oh yeah i learned that in like oh four oh three my first coach taught me that and dean was like no way i was like no <laughs> way you know so uh, because I had been footlocked so many times, I was very calm in this position. Pry the feet, move them out of the way, come on top. And he, this guy had been crossing my feet. That's how I got a knee on belly. He crossed my feet so he could work for whatever heel hook. And that ended up, you know, being a detriment to him because I'm moving into the knee on belly. And you can tell... I'm thinking strike this this base my base knee is not up classic white belt mistake you know I tell the white belts even in our fundamentals class mm -hmm. that knee points toward the ceiling because that if that knee points toward the ceiling then your foot can give you drive from the floor of the canvas into your um, positional leg my left shin across his belly. So right now I feel probably extremely light to him, which is why he can bring his hips up in the air and throw his legs over. But like I said, I just wanted to, I'm like very young in my fighting uh, career, but I'm a fighter and I wanted to just drop these bombs on top of him. You know, I wanted to do some damage with my hands. Does that mistake get made because you feel like you're being heavy right there? No. Or is it just a white belt mistake? I think classic white belt just mistake. White belt I just mistake, yeah. like I told you, I was somehow positionally on top. Yeah. This is exactly it. I'm just not positionally strong. Same way with that high mount in the beginning, which got him to get out of it. My mount wasn't strong. So standing over my opponent, I showed my top control was weak. Mm -hmm. He escapes my mount, showing that my mount control is weak. He goes to escape my knee on belly, showing my knee on belly is weak, and you can just you can flat out see the mistakes I'm making here. Now he's con you know confusing me and he's wiry and, but if you are good, these things wouldn't happen to you. No, yeah. So I'm moving. I'm doing what I should be doing, moving those out of the way and move to mount. But this is great on him. I love this. So like, if I go to sit up to punch, he thrown the feet over before. He quits throwing the feet over. If I sit up, he sits up. Mm -hmm. Awesome. You know, locking the hands around my low back and then pulling my hands back into the mat because if my hands are in the mat, they're not on him. But then he goes back. I'm starting to pin the arm, and I really just want to lay this guy out. A couple big bombs. You know, m my brother was uh, – you know, super high on his uh, last performance in that tournament and um, where he was able to knock his second opponent out with hammer fists, if we remember. And uh, I wanted to get that feeling because I had tapped everybody out it, up until now on my wins, which is great. I like submissions. I love them. You know, there's nothing more to me when people talk about savagery and they talk about um, violence. You think of these hands, catch these hands, and that's cool to be able to shut the human being switch off. I know it's cool. Um, they go down, they go out, they're out for a second or they're out, out for a while. Um, that's a cool feeling. But sometimes when you drop somebody, you guys have seen in the UFC or other shows many, many times, you floor the guy, you you know, he looks knocked out, but it's your continuation of striking that's waking him back up, and now he's mm -hmm. back in the fight. With a strangulation? No question. You would die. You'd die. Yeah. If it wasn't for that third man that was in there to protect you from me, this choke 
it's up to me to hold it as long as I feel like. So if it wasn't, for, you know, you talk about violent and savage um, or alpha or whatever. You just don't wake up. You know, how about I just hold this and you don't wake up? Why? You know, uh, and, th- and then if you to look at the other the other end of that, the lights just go out, right? You don't have a say. You don't have a say. And like they say in MMA, anybody can get caught, which is true. Mm-hmm. But when you get caught with a submission, you made the conscious effort to say, I quit. I give up. Now, before with the striking, you can the guy could say, "Man, if I didn't go out, I would have fought, you know, to the death or whatever." That ref didn't stop it, the, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, or I, I just didn't go to sleep. You know, you didn't break me. That's true, right? Mm-hmm. I physiologically broke you, but mentally I didn't break you. Right. But when you mentally break a man, you physically broke him too. He submits. You did both. So if I had your arm. I just take it home. And it's true. If you uh, break the arm or the knee or the ankle, um, shoulder, wrist, whatever, if you break those things, yes, they're not dead. And yes, they can continue. But to what level of potential can they continue? They're, They're minus an arm now. Or they're hobbling on one leg. Cool. If you get up, if you get back up, now you can catch these hands. I like the the concept of the break leads to the strangulation. Oh, yeah. Of like, okay, I broke your arm, and you didn't care, but cool, I broke it to climb up further yeah. up your back and still and choke you. Right, right. Now you have a broke arm and you're unconscious. Yes. Yeah, so I, I do love the submission, but at this point, I wanted to just drop these hands. Do you have elbows yet? No, no, no not, not in this state um, with the ISCF. Now, I got you. I'd already fought in Virginia where they did it and in Louisiana where they did it. Mm -hmm. So it was not strange to me to fight under that rules, but under the ISCF in Georgia, they had no elbows for amateurs. I got you. Okay. So this was like the interesting position, this rubber guard, this rubber mount (laughs) position he's playing. But instead of me taking my arm on the outside of his leg, that's where I'd be getting stuck and him prying off. I've, I've fought my way to have the inside position and ultimately led to breaking his uh, grip on his self toe hold there. But she's doing his best, you know, like that's, I'm not faulting this guy. You know, he, I'm well aware that we're both amateurs and you can already see me working for this arm here, you know, and the length and the wiriness, most people, this is not because of my awesome arm bar. Let me tell you that. You know, like is most people. hair swoosh? Is that what <laughs> no, it is? It, it's his wiriness and the length of his arms and mm. him holding himself in this position. You can see his shoulders are stapled to the mat. Well, if you want to control the arm on an arm bar, you want to control their shoulder because that's the, that's the, what I'm going to refer to as the highest most joint. The, um, the fingers um, or the wrist for MMA would be the lowest you know, as far as just like okay. top of the head is highest, uh, feet would be lowest. So for the arm, the shoulder is the highest joint. So you want to control as much of the shoulder. So I would like my left knee to be behind his scapula if possible, but his scaps are on the mat, mm-hmm. right? So in most cases, the arm would not be there, but I think that You can kind of see how I've got – he's got really long arms, and I'm already controlling the arm because he's trying to do this escape. And, look, I'm just able to initiate this kind of like almost a chair sit style, but then I just fall back into the arm, and it's his length. And that you can see that's pretty deep arm bar. Um, I'll try to go back. Did you just pivot off of his chest? Yeah, I just kind of did an old, very good, just an old school, like uh, make the diamond on the chest with your hands, and then you kind of hit this pivot. I didn't do that specific setup. You can see. But that's what you did with your hips. Yeah, you can see me trying to cross his arms and do a two on one control, make an X while I'm fighting his feet with my hand. I'm doing all these things, but then I just feel the arm is there. So I just kind of pivot. There we go. And I'm in on this thing. And he's fighting. He was strong. But my hips go up. And I do remember his elbow popping. Do you know how many times? No, it was like, not like a, 
not like that, but this. Uh, like that's what yeah, it kind of yeah, yeah. sounds like, like I not quite like, like that, but yeah, yeah, it's like the, like the, the paper kind of tearing, like, yeah, kind of like that. But it sounds like it's almost kind of wet. Yeah. Well, well, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. That's what <laughs> mine. That's what mine sounded <laughs> it like. Sounds like it's wet. That's what mine sounded like when it popped out. Okay. When I ruptured the capsule. Like the sound of the cups, capsule rupturing was like a moist ripping sound. Mm. Yeah, well, this sounded more like uh, the the tendons uh, okay. and the ligaments okay. being stretched and strained and sprained and ripping. That's more kind of what it was. I got you. Um, but I get the arm bar here. I remember bridging up, and you can like I said, this is anticlimactic for me because I got the mount. I wanted to rain down the bombs, but and I knew I had to fight a second time, and that you know it's important to not get too excited for me. To be able to to know I have to fight again and I've uh, accomplished nothing right now, but how'd you feel physically? Like like did you feel like that had taken a lot out of you? No, no. Um, but it's interesting that it was me that had been armbarred in a similar position just a year ago in the same uh, place, and it felt good to be on the other end of it. And even when we go back and we look at his arm. This is what my arm looked like, you know, because of his, this guy's features are similar to mine, like the length. And I was trying to do the same thing with my feet. I don't know if you remember, I, I kicked my foot over Daiso Ashigi's face. Like I was mm-hmm. trying to get out like that, mm-hmm. or I tried to anyways. And uh, that was it, you know. That was a tight arm bar. Very tight arm bar. How far in were you again? Uh, a year? No, uh, a year into my fighting career um, as an amateur. Let's pull it up. A year in. One, two, three, four, five, six, but seven fights. How, how long have you been grappling by that point? My first fight, I had five months of training. Okay. That's so, pretty impressive for somebody with like a year and a half of grappling. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, I mean, me and Mike have talked about fight. that. Yeah. You know, we just got to it. But, um, and I had a surgery in here somewhere also. I think it was in August of this year. Yeah. <laughs> so that's seven fights, and that for 2004, that's one, two, three, four, five. And I ended up having six fights in 2004, and, I, and I had a, a major surgery in that time. You were busy, bro. So I was. What surgery was it? That was where I had the uh, forearm. I got, got a bone removed from. It was a fracture. So what was the recovery? It's a that? fracture that happened in 2003, uh, from my dad, and I can get into that <laughs> later. But I had, I had, it healed all wrong, and it wasn't healed. I actually still had a fracture in my arm, and they had to take a bone from my hip and fill in the space because this this the break had gotten worse. And then, um, then they've had a plate and seven screws that they put in my arm. And so I had like an internal, like morphine pump, you know, like a pick line or whatever. Oh God. And you know, I, I mean, I was jacked up for real. So wow. somewhere in that, I want to say it was August, maybe I'm mixing up, um, the month from another surgery that I had, but I'm just looking at this and I think that that makes sense. Yes. That's when I had it, it was like August or Wow. You know, something like that, August, and then September, October, November. So, you know, and I felt like that was an eternity. Yeah. And and the doctor told me I'd never fight again. So this just tells you, like, nobody – first off, doctors, if they don't know what you're doing, they can't tell you if you can do it or not. They call it practicing medicine for a reason. Yeah. So, like, he's telling me I could never fight, but he didn't know what fighting was. He had no clue what it was. He told yep. me that I'd never fight again and that if I even got good enough to fight again, that he highly recommended I not. Mm-hmm. It's man, I wish I could tell you guys who the surgeon was because like I, I, I'll I'll call somebody out. You know, I don't I don't mind. Um but that's just the level of, of the time that we were in. That was like a time period era. And also a, that's a a big problem. I think that many of the the viewers um can agree that just in medicine people who have played a sport this and that like they'll tell you that they'll like to put their limitations very low and if you overcome it 
then they like to take the praise for it. You know, mm-hmm. oh, I was not expected to walk again, but the doctor mm-hmm. or the physical therapist did such a good job. You know, I've, I've always treated just, doctors just tell me what not to do, like yeah. what, like what will kill me. Okay, don't do that. I don't need any any more information. Yeah, but how about you actually? Before I tell this guy he can or can't do something, let me find out what it is. You know, I'm sure that uh, probably like BMX bike riding and uh, maybe horse racing is probably more brutal on the body, you know, than than uh, MMA fighting was at that time. You know, maybe maybe not, but but depends on how good you yeah, are. At the other if two, you, if you don't know anything about something, how about you research it, find out what areas of the body this affects, what you can do and can't do. Like, yeah, this has turned into a you know what really grinds my gears episode, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, it's a cool fight. Uh, appreciate Matt Waller for putting that fight on and kind of like letting us in Middle Georgia show what our capabilities were. I think that we went 500 for the night. You know, myself and Bubby won a fight apiece. Jake Vickers won. So that's 3-0 and for the night. Corsi unfortunately lost 3-1 and for the night. My dad lost three and two, and uh, yeah, so three and two for the night. Not awesome, um, but it's to each their own. Like that first night in uh, Macon on the the previous SFO, it wasn't my night, but uh, you know Trey Brown or whoever else they had a great night. So that's fighting, um, wins and losses, people. But it was really cool, cool time to be in fighting. I really. Uh, advise you guys to maybe check out some of the previous uh, episodes and listen to how me and Bubby and my brother Micah talk about it and, and Matt Waller and how we talk about these things. And you'll kind of just get an idea of what fighting was like in that time. This is very exciting. Like to be an amateur fighter even was like a, a big deal. Like there wasn't like anybody really before us that was doing that from our town in Macon. Um, know that Ken Shamrock I think he was born in Macon but he didn't grow up in Macon he didn't you know he moved out to California or whatever and that's where he got his exposure and to uh, fighting but so nobody was doing it from our area and we were doing it and um, we had direction and we knew that we wanted to, to fight for sure so appreciate you guys tuning in the next episode will be for me it'll be either ashley croft and that fight happened in valdosta georgia or maybe i'll be able to come back and we'll do that uh viewing and the watching with trey brown you know where that'll be cool right we can sit down with the opponent and talk talk about it you know um but that fight happened in valdosta in a um like a barn like an agricultural oh, yeah. an ag center kind of thing oh yeah but it was it was not like there's ag centers that are like the one in uh, Perry here. That's like a big ass arena. No, it's like that's dirt not what floors. I'm Smelled like manure. Yeah, and the the ring had a patch in the center of it, like yes. a big ass patch. And yeah, a okay, rickety on the edge. Yeah, so I'm gonna I'll I'll see if I can reach out to Trey Brown and if we can make this happen. But I appreciate you guys tuning in, kind of going on these trips down memory lane with me and being able to check out my old fights and my career and seeing what I thought about it. And then when we have the guests where they can kind of remind me a little bit better of what things were like and how it was. Appreciate y'all.